Hi everyone, welcome to Sussex Writes. This event is part of the inaugural Sussex Festival of Ideas, a dynamic and engaging programme of talks, events and activities. The festival is being produced by the newly formed School of Media, Arts and Humanities at Sussex University. And this event is being recorded and will be posted to the Festival of Ideas website after the festival. Live captioning is available and can be activated by pressing the live transcript button on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. A member of the festival's team may contact attendees for feedback afterwards. If you do not wish to be contacted, please email the festival team to opt out. You can do so on the festival website. We welcome your questions via the Q&A panel, also found on the bottom right hand corner, and these will be responded to throughout. I will now hand over to Dr Tom Bamford-Blake. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to Sussex Rights. I'm going to just share our opening slide with you here. So today we are going to be looking at, um, so today we're going to be um, going through initially a bit of a presentation on who, who we are at Sussex Rights, what we do, uh, what our priorities are, what we've been doing over the past few years. Um, and then after that, we are going to um, have an opportunity for you to ask questions to the team um, about what we do and kind of hear a bit more from us. And then finally, we're going to run a creative writing session, which is going to be a sort of a bit of a flavour of the kind of thing that we do in schools, uh, particularly in the context of the online workshops that we've been doing during lockdown recently. Um, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Dr. Tom Bamford Blake. Um, I am a lecturer in American Studies and American Literature, and I've been working with Sussex Rights for a few years. I'm currently the assistant director. Um, what I'm now going to do, I'm just going to go around the group and introduce um, the, um, the team members um, who are going to say a little bit about themselves and are going to ask each team member to um, say who they are and what initially drew them to Sussex Rights. Um, so if we could hear from, I'm just going to go around the order that I have people on the screen. So could I hear from uh, Katie first? Thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, so hi, everyone. My name's Katie. Um, I've just finished my final year studying drama and English as an undergraduate. Um, I joined Sussex Rights actually through a friend studying psychology, um, but I really resonated with a lot of the sort of epithet that Sussex Rights has. So. I currently work for the widening participation team, um, which seeks to sort of uplift underprivileged individuals in their journey to university. And I found that Sussex Rights had a really similar thing with English specifically um, in terms of sort of showing the sort of creative side of English, the side that's not just all focused on exams, um, showing them that it is something that is a possibility for them to pursue in the future. So yeah, that's sort of what drew me to Sussex Rights. Did you want me to pass the next person, Tom? Yeah, uh, could I go to Alice next, please? Hi everyone, um, my name is Alice. <clears throat> I'm a linguistic student at Sussex, I'm an undergraduate. Uh, but before that, I was uh, an ESL tutor for five years. Uh, so I was very attracted to Sussex because I wanna keep using those tutoring, tutoring and teaching skills. But also I think uh, tutoring is going to be quite an important part of life, at least for the next year or so, um, what with everything that's happened in, in schools recently. And I want to be part of that. And Sussex Rights seems to be a really positive force kind of within that whole movement. And uh, that's kind of what drew me to it. OK, thank you. And could we hear from, uh, could we hear from Ellie, please? Yeah, so hi, um, I'm Ellie. I've just finished my undergraduate degree in English. Um, I was originally drawn to Sussex Rights after doing a creative writing module with Emma Newport, um, which was brilliant. And it just, it felt like a really good opportunity to uh, sort of get back into creative writing and enjoy it um, and try and sort of pass on that enjoyment to other people. Um, but it's taken me in a direction I didn't think it would, where it's it, it has sort of inspired me to become a teacher myself. So it's actually helped me to go into the future and know what I want to do. So I'm really grateful that I joined. So yeah, that's, that was my story with it. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Adam. Hi there, yeah, I'm Adam. I had a very similar story to Katie in the sense that a friend of mine who did psychology um, passed on the idea of joining to me and I found that I really enjoy creative writing before coming to university and I'd sort of lost a bit of that passion 
and throughout. And so then this opportunity came about to try and ignite that and hopefully pass on to other people. I tried it and um, I've really enjoyed it over my final year. Fantastic. Thank you. And let's hear from Saskia. So I'm an undergrad student as well. I study English literature. I had a sort of funny experience coming to Sussex because I transferred here into second year during the pandemic. So I was looking kind of for English lit based communities at Sussex and I came across Sussex Rights and it's been such a sort of lovely way to get to know people at Sussex, but also to reach out to the kind of wider community. Um, and I've been mentoring and doing other projects and it's, yeah, it's been really exciting and such a sort of lovely thing to have during lockdown and COVID and everything. Thank you. And finally, let's hear from Emma Newport. Hi, uh, I'm Emma Newport. I'm a lecturer in English um, as part of MAR, um, and I am the founder of Sussex Rights. Um, so uh, I began with uh, three students in one school for one workshop, and since then we really developed this as a program. And at its heart, um, it's all the things that you'll hear about what we do, you know, Tom's going to give us a, a, a sample of all the different kinds of activities that we now do. Um, it's all student led and student generated. And um, that's such an important part of it because it's it's been built together. So Tom and I have an important role in, in supporting and, and, and guiding our teams. But it's really exciting from our point of view to see how uh, students work together, how they develop their ideas, their skills, and they do really important work. And, and that's just a delight to watch not only the programme grow, but more importantly, watch those who take part in the programme develop. And we see them develop friendships and skills and um, leadership qualities and, um, and give something back to the community and help us secure that next generation of passionate uh enthusiasts for being creative so um it's a real pleasure to in some senses sit back and, and watch everybody else uh run with it and I, I hope tom won't mind but you know tom himself actually began his work at, with sussex rights as a phd student and so i've watched him over the years you know progress into now um uh as a lecturer and again sort of seeing all, all different students from different ages and stages um taking part is one of i think the great strengths of, of what we do um, and again you'll have a mix of, of people um, you're from second years up to PhD students all working together and collaborating and I think that's a really powerful thing too um, because I think sometimes you get a little bit segregated with our year group and it's really lovely to work with different people at different stages and that also supports people on their journey through academia as they get to spend time with people who've been through what they've been through and, and, and all of those things so I think Sussex Rights is, at its heart is, is just something that does so much in so many different ways and, and none of it I could have expected when we started with that one workshop but it's been really exciting and um, and powerful to see how it's gone on to, um, to work in, in this plural and um, important way. Yeah, thank you so much Emma, I think that sums it up really well. Um, and so I'm going to build on what we've just heard. Uh, with uh, a bit of a slideshow um, giving some examples of the kind of thing that we've been up to, a bit of a, a potted history of Sussex rights. Um, and just a reminder, if you do have any questions, like things that you'd like to hear more about or that you found really interesting um, about it in the slideshow, uh, then please do um, post those in the Q&A panel uh, in the Q&A box and we'll be able to respond to those after the slideshow as a, as a team. So please do keep that in mind. So let me just share screen for you here. So um, Sussex Rights, as we've heard, um, a, a transformative student-led creative writing programme. And the mission, when it initially started, was to help young people across Sussex to be creative and to inspire passionate writing. And this was really by way, in particular, of outreach from uh, Sussex University to the local community and to schools, um, working specifically with, with widening participation at Sussex, who, who we couldn't have done it without at the same time. A lot of the text I'm using here, by the way, can be found on the Sussex Rights website, which uh, there'll be a link to all of our web pages and social media at the end of the slideshow, so watch out for that. Um, so as Emma said, um, first, 
developed in 2016 by Emma, uh, began as a pilot of three undergraduates leading two creative writing workshops in one school uh, to represent a cross-university initiative drawing up to 30 students due to some range of disciplines. That was where it started out. Um, and um, it's, however, probably many years, it, five years later now, um, it is uh, grown even further. Um, I might kind of uh, call upon Emma here and there to, to give us a few more facts and figures on exactly how much it's grown because she's, she's the one who's good with numbers. Um, but we had really positive feedback from our initial, um, from our initial sessions. So these are from back in 2017. Some of the initial thoughts that really got us going were 98% of participating school students felt they learned new things about creative writing, 100% um, were encouraged to consider university in the future, and 80% found our events interesting. We've worked with over 25 primary and secondary schools, um, and the positive responses range from really simple things like learning how to make a more powerful opening sentence um, to more kind of emotional and personal things, I think, like feeling more comfortable reading out your work in front of a group of people. Um, this is a this is a kind of uh, a guideline that we were using a few years ago for our workshops, um, and we still kind of work to this 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 template for a lot of what we do. So a team of a team of fifteen to to 20 students working in teams of three to five in schools. Uh, back in 2018, we had 13 participating schools. Uh, now it's uh, since then it's, it's grown significantly. Um, it was funded by uh, by SLN Cop Innovations Fund and Unwinding Participation a few years ago, and we've received kind of funding from various sources since then. Um, and the the kind of aim of Sussex Rights really all the way through, just to, to build on what Emma's already said, has been to um, introduce a different kind of learning into schools. Um, one of the purposes of that is to assist school students with their uh, with their GCSE programs um, in, and and uh, and other levels as well. But we've done a lot of work with GCSE students, uh, particularly kind of English language skills and things like that. But in a much broader sense, it really is about um, introducing kinds of learning and kinds of study to 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 schools that aren't just kind of instrumental, aren't just about you know these are the skills you need to get your grades and to, to get the right kind of job, but to really promote creative writing as um, an end in itself and something that is rewarding psychologically, intellectually, um, emotionally. Um, and I think through our sessions in schools with, with the basic model um, that I've just kind of shown you, we've been able to really, really balance those two things, the practical function um, of helping with the school curriculum, but also really going beyond the curriculum. Um, to to introduce new kinds of learning to students and hopefully give them a flavour of the more kind of open kinds of learning, the types of critical and creative thinking that are offered at a university such as Sussex and therefore to, to give something outward facing um, that shows students what Sussex is about and the kind of role that Sussex can play. Um, from the point of view of our, our tutors, um, tutors are are drawn from the, from the student body. I think as Emma already said, the, the vast majority of the people working within the program are, are, are undergraduate students with a few postgraduate students as well. Um, and this is really, really key to what Sussex Rights is. Um, it's about empowering students to, um, to build their own lesson plans, to, to develop really useful experience, and to have a chance to share their own ideas and develop their own ideas um, in connection with, with school students. One of the things that makes that so appealing uh, for school students is that they are talking to people who who differently from their teachers, people who are a bit kind of closer to their own age, people who are offering a different kind of perspective, people who don't come across as authority figures in, in the same kind of teacherly way, and they can have more of a kind of open and, and real conversation with. Um, I wonder if this would be a good chance to to hear a bit more um, from, from, from Emma and from other members of the panel about what some of those kind of initial values were uh, for the program and how we've been able to, to develop that over the years, building on what I've just said. Um, Ellie, perhaps you could come in and explain a little bit more about your social media role that you've taken on. I think that's uh, an important context to provide. Yeah, sure. Um, so for the previous year, I've taken on the role of social media management. Um, which basically, here we go, put a lovely slide about it here. <laughs> um, it basically means um, that I'm in charge of all of our social media pages. We've got our Instagram, our Twitter, and our Facebook are the sort of three really important ones. 
Um, and we've been trying to keep that really active um, and really present over the past year to sort of build up a bit more of a following, um, to try and sort of gain new followers, spread awareness about Sussex rights and what we do um, with the aim to kind of get in contact with more schools as well. Um, so the sort of things that we share on there are posts that would sort of, well, it says here, so promote upcoming events um, such as writing competitions, festivals like this, interesting talks. Um, I'm sure Emma wouldn't mind me saying she did a great talk with um, Lem Sasse recently as part of the Brighton Festival, which was really brilliant. Um, we share a lot of our own latest work um, that the cheaters do. So we have a great blog um, that you'll be able to check out from the links at the end of this slide as well, where we share a lot of posts about writing, creativity, what it means to do our workshops. Um, and there's been a lot in the previous year about how to sort of handle studying during these COVID times and how the move to online learning has been very difficult and challenging, um, but how we have dealt with it and how we sort of suggest other people can help to handle it as well. Um, and yeah, the other things we do on the social media is make sure that we're responding to all of the comments and messages and inquiries from the public, um, which means that in my role in particular, I have to be very, um, very on top of liaising with the whole team and knowing what's going on at all times and who's in charge of what, which is a lot, but it's um, been incredible to learn to balance that alongside my degree as well. It's, I've learned some skills that I'll definitely take away from it. But yeah, our social media, I think is a brilliant way of staying in contact with Sussex Rights and to know what we're doing and what's going on. So if any of you are interested in what we do and what we do going forwards, I'd definitely recommend following us. Um, yeah, you've got the you've got the QR code here. If you'd rather do that, you can scan that. It'll take you straight to our link tree where you've got um, links to all of our things. You've got all of our social medias, our website, blog, YouTube channel, etc. Uh, we've got a great newsletter as well that comes out monthly, or you can follow us directly on the social medias there. Thank you so much, Ellie. Yeah. Um... And so social media from the start has been a really key part of what we do with Sussex Rights, of uh, sharing what we do with, the, with, with communities, with schools um, and, and with uh, people in the academic world as well. Um, and we'll, we'll hear a bit more um, about the newsletter when we, we talk to Katie a bit later on. Um, so to go back to kind of earlier in the, in the slides, um, a few examples of, of the kinds of things that we have have covered in our initial schools workshops uh, when we first started out. Um, the key here is is using the kinds of prompts that um, enable students to get started on a creative writing project if they don't feel kind of confident or comfortable with with creative writing initially. Uh, so one example of an exercise we do is where do you think you feel these emotions? Where would you where on the body would you place um, would you place the emotion would you place it in the head in the heart in the arms etc etc and we always find that even students who, who don't have prior experience with creative writing come up with really um, imaginative and interesting examples of this by kind of drawing lines between uh, the words and the body and kind of and coloring in um, and so we're using kind of kind of tactile things like that using paper handouts using using felt -tip pens to color visual things like this uh, is really key another favorite uh, thing that we like to do is writing prompts, uh, which and we'll, we're going to use kind of a version of that, a slightly different version later on in this session. Um, so writing prompts can be can be verbal. So loneliness feels like happiness is um, or they can be um, actually phys physical, visual, tangible. So all of the objects shown are objects that we would actually take into the classroom uh, when we were doing physical things in classrooms. And we would get the students to kind of look at the objects, handle the objects and get that really kind of kind of tactile sense beyond the visual of what that object might be and, and get them to do, um, as you see towards the bottom, a descriptive piece based on the object or a tale told from the perspective of the object. A particular favorite is the creepy doll um, on the top right hand, uh, which we've made up all kinds of stories about being haunted or cursed in various ways, which is always good for the kids to engage with because they love horror. The stories will always go towards kind of something, you know, ghoulish, particularly uh, GCSE and pre-GCSE. So anything like that is always really good. Um, a, a session that I ran for, for sixth form students, uh, so this was aimed at slightly older students, uh, was around collage poetry. So I posted some examples of kind of cutting edge modern collage poetry, such as the above. 
um, and I then got a bunch of newspapers, magazines, and got the students to to cut out bits and images and words and to make their own uh, collage poetry, and that came up with some really amazing results as well. Um, so obviously, all of this had to change quite a bit when we went into lockdown in March 2020. Um, I think one of the real privileges of being involved with Sussex Rights at that time is how, you know, and, uh, you know, at risk of embarrassing Emma, this this was kind of under you know Emma's leadership. Um, how quickly we were able to pivot to doing amazing online projects that really kind of kept both Sussex Rights going and broadened um, the base of what we could do uh, in that context. So one of the really amazing things we did was we we collaborated with uh, Youth Cafe Kenya, which is an amazing uh, youth um, youth education and mental health organisation based out of Kenya. Um, it's a, but, but in fact, an inter international organisation with with Kenya as its base. We set up a series of events that we called Lockdown Live, and these consisted of some. Um, Zoom chats that were live streamed over Facebook, I think, in much the same way as as, as this is being live streamed right now. And uh, on the left, you can see some some of the lovely faces from one of those sessions. And this was a a, a combination of students from Sussex Rights and uh, students who were connected through the youth youth cafe projects um, to have this kind of international discussion about what education means, what what mental health means, um, and how we can use those things to try to navigate through this global situation of lockdown and how it's affecting everyone. Uh, this was an amazing project. Um, it was a real privilege to be involved with it. Um, and, um, you know, meeting people and encountering perspectives that you would, would never have encountered otherwise, finding out how much we have in common, how we can collaborate, and things like this. Um, the were also a series of YouTube videos that we produced, um, including Ask an Expert videos on um, things like misinformation, um, particularly how misinformation appears uh, within within COVID and how to avoid that, how to navigate that, and on talks on mental health and psychology as well. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, you can see on screen um, some examples of the amazing people that we were able to to talk to there. Um, anyone else who, uh, anyone in our, our team who was involved with those kind of lockdown live projects want to want to share anything about that that I haven't yet been able to cover? Um, yeah, uh, it was a really great experience and I think what was uh, particularly powerful about it was that it connected 54 young people aged between 14 and about 25 around the world um, and again uh, whilst we provided the scaffolding for that and Tom did a bit of, of chairing and I did a lot of the behind the scenes kind of organising, the topics and the direction of the conversation, the questions that frame the conversation, they were all generated by the young people taking part. And so when we covered the topics of learning in lockdown, um, misinformation and disinformation um, and uh, post-COVID recovery and mental health, those were all topics that the, the team of participants that had decided was was their um, was was their greatest concern, and they also worked worked through as a team the questions that they wanted to ask of the experts. And so it was very much a conversation directed as as the youth cafe um, gave us this phrase, you know, uh, by young people for young people. And I think at a time when um, it felt like young people were particularly bearing the um, sharp end of, of COVID in terms of the disruption to education and um, to missing out on quite a lot of their formative experiences um, and also you know having to deal with disruptive uh, experiences around work and, and, and um, with family. Um, it felt like a really important way to allow people to talk to each other but also to talk to um, to older people and and their educators about their experiences in their own way and in their own words and I think that was really um it helped me then come back and become a better lecturer and educator when I when we were teaching in uh, this year as well so I think that's something that I just wanted to, to sort of recognize which was um lockdown live really did uh did really help educate a, 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 a wide community of, of people um, and also that it's led to new great projects around um, youth mental health 
and and so again that sense of the energy that comes from from these kinds of events um is worth acknowledging too yeah thank you emma that's really well put and, and like you say um on top of everything else as teachers it was was really great experience for us and helped us to to do better by students as well um so a few other things that happened during lockdown the blog was 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 really active uh, some examples on the right of uh some great articles and again produced by by our, our student members primarily um that went up on our, our wordpress and then um on the right um we had this um, again amazing experience of um a 13 year old 13 year old boy who was being bullied over his his love of books and we were able to participate in a project to basically support him through that and send him a ton of books and um send him a uh, messages of support um uh, through that and really you know promote the idea of of, of reading um and kind of in a sense, you know, defend the idea of, of, of reading for young people, I think, and, and the kind of, you know, the positive mental health aspects of that. Um, and there was there was yet more during lockdown. Um, the blog was really active, um, we, um, as I just said. Um, YouTube study videos we produced. Um, so this is a screenshot of our amazing YouTube page. And these are study videos produced for school students by, by university students, giving guidance on um subjects primarily within english literature and english language that were familiar to them um again students being able to offer their own perspective on something in a way that was was really helpful really useful to school students and and, and giving them um a, a a different angle on things and and schools were able to commission specific targeted videos on things that they they needed um, support with as well um we ran a christmas card initiative um, sending individualized Christmas cards from our um, Sussex Rights team members to vulnerable people over Christmas, which was um, fantastic. Uh, we ran a series of competitions, um, again, over social media, um, getting amazing creative writing responses from um, school age students. And again, as a way to really encourage creative writing um, and that kind of engagement uh, through lockdown. Um, and one of the running themes of all this has been helping students to engage who have been disenfranchised and isolated by the lockdown experience um, through not being physically at school um, or through just you know, the general kind of mental health impact of that experience. And we'll hear some more kind of targeted examples of that in a second. Um, and finally, the tutoring itself. So alongside really broadening and diversifying what we do, um, we um, um, moved a lot of our tutoring online and we were able to run some really amazing um, Zoom tutoring sessions uh, with schools, again, building those kind of kind of kind of connections which had been somewhat damaged by the lockdown experience so we worked with 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 the guides who i haven't listed here and we worked with red balloon center who we'll hear a bit more from about in a minute uh we worked with the all sorts organization and we uh, we worked with with ormiston school as well um and so if i can um we'll hear we'll hear about um our experiences with red balloon center by way of a bit of a case study of what the kinds of really amazing work we've been able to do during lockdown if we could um we, we could hear back about that so i started uh, mentoring with red balloon i can't actually remember the date but i feel like it was a while ago and it kind of got disrupted a little bit with uh several lockdowns we've had but it has been um such a great experience i've put together a little bit of information about sort of what we do and how a regular session will run um which is on the next slide Thank you. So normally I tutor about once a week um, and I have one student um, who's in your turn and after getting to know her a little bit and sort of talking and just going back to what we mentioned earlier, I think it's quite helpful for some of the students to have uh, a university student sort of teaching them or mentoring them as opposed to maybe somebody who they think of as an authority figure who can feel a bit daunting and a little bit um formal so I feel like with these sessions it's been lovely to get to really know my student so um I've really tailored the sessions to suit her needs and to engage her interest in creative writing so not just that she comes to the sessions and does creative writing but kind of encourage her to read outside of the sessions and to write outside of our time together um next slide please 
So my student has a great love of crime and mystery stories. So we've kind of focused our sessions on how to create suspense and actually thinking about, well, how do we create suspense? What kind of skills we want to use? So how do we include captivating details? How do we show rather than tell? And um, it's been such a fantastic experience because my student has um, produced some amazing pieces of work. And um, I've actually sort of finished a session. I've been like, wow, that was incredibly impressive for my student to come up with that and sort of her imagination's gone into places I wouldn't have thought of and um, it's been very rewarding. Um, and then I've just got some examples of slides. So yeah, as I was saying, it's been amazing to see her confidence grow and a real highlight of my week. So I've got tutoring tomorrow and it's really lovely putting my slides together and thinking about where the session will go. Um, and she's also really enjoyed the sessions. So it's been really, really, it's been very mutually rewarding, I feel. And I've just got some examples of slides. So one of our sessions was thinking about the future. So it's kind of teaching about how do we use pathetic fallacy to set the seed? So how can we place human emotions and things like the weather or the environment and then adjectives? And then I've got a little bit more on the next slide about visual stimulation, which I think is really key with creative writing. So what, how can we sort of visually stimulate the readers, but then also ourselves? And then on the next slide, I've got a bit about um, just prompts. So um, how to include sort of pieces of information that captivate the audience, thinking about perspective, thinking about sort of relationships, thinking about how to create suspense. And then um, at the end of the session, we both actually write a little bit. And it's lovely because then we'll share with each other what we've written and then I can sort of suggest things to her about how to maybe improve the writing or to like give feedback. And then uh, the final slide, please. Yeah, so again, she really likes crime and mystery stories. So this was all about detective stories. So here we kind of focused more on character description, thinking about objects, thinking about a story behind an object. How do we create something small in the plot that actually plays a bigger part later on? Um, final slide, I think. And then, yeah, just to fit. So she's writing on it. She's working on a story at the moment. Um, which I think we'll be going back to tomorrow. And it's, yeah, it's been a great experience to see her sort of progress and she'll come to the session and she's been doing stuff throughout the week to actually work on the writing. So that's great. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Saskia. I'm just going to come in because Saskia has given us a really lovely picture of the on the ground work. Um, and she's also been um, very tactful about talking about the Red Balloon Centre. Um, but I think it's worth acknowledging what the Red Balloon Centre is in order to really understand how amazing it is that you have a young person who is actually doing work in between her tutoring sessions and is getting really excited. But the Red Balloon Centre is um, a centre for learning for students who have um, exited mainstream education. This is usually for a variety of reasons. It's often family disruption. It might be for health reasons. Um, it might also be because they've experienced some form of exclusion, whether that's self-exclusion or some other kind of um, exclusion from school. So the Red Balloon Center is targeting uh, students who've often been traumatized by their learning experiences. Either they've been victims of bullying or they've had undiagnosed um, additional needs and they've had really negative experiences of their education system. So I think that really contextualizes what Saski is doing to have somebody um, working on that one-to-one -one basis, really injecting a love of being creative, of developing an, a, a, a passion and confidence in their self-expression is really valuable. And that ability to tailor to what they're excited by is really a key to unlocking a lot of that. Um, which is why it's so great to give our students the freedom to build those relationships. And we are really careful to tip people who are passionate about working in those ways and, and think in those terms. And I think Sassy has given us a wonderful example of um, how that journey takes place. So thank you, Sassy. Yeah, really amazing work. And thank you for sharing that so well. And for another example of some of the amazing work uh, that um, our, our, our members have been doing um, during lockdown, we're going to hear a bit from, from Katie, I think. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, I'm actually going to ask you to go to the next slide first. Um, so that's our current newsletter. 
Um, so Ellie, myself and another member of our team have sort of worked on this the past few months, taken it over from Tom just to sort of increase the student led aspect of Sussex rights. Um, so here you've got like a really brief sort of look over of our June newsletter. Um, so we kind of split it into the three groups. So Ellie works on the blog posts and um, we thought that made a lot of sense since she does the social media anyway. Um, so she's been such an asset really helping out with that even when she was on holiday in the Highlands was helping us out with that, which was really great. Um, we've also got a section on events. So in our main newsletter, we actually advertised this festival of ideas. So if you're here from the newsletter, welcome. Um, we also have things like um, one of our tutors suggested mentioning religious holidays as a way of including both sort of external members and also members of our team, uh, which we've taken on board. Um, yeah, we've, we've got lots of different things going on that we're advertising to schools and anyone really who's interested. So when we go back to the previous slide, um, if anyone's interested now, we've got a QR code for you to sign up to the newsletter. Uh, yeah, fabulous. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, so um, I've just been overseeing that. Um, I partially took on the role as during lockdown, I um, was just trying to find something to do. And I'd always been quite interested in copywriting. Um, and I applied for an internship, which unfortunately I didn't get. Um, but one of the skills they asked for was MailChimp, which since through working from Sussex Rights, I've been able to um, develop that skill. And it's, I think it's very easy to say, oh, I've developed my confidence and I've developed my public speaking, which are all really great skills to have in the workplace. But I'm also really proud to say that I've got this tangible skill that I can put on my CV through Sussex Rights, which is also really helpful for me looking for whatever job really, um, not just something within copywriting, it could be anything, but having that tangible skill has definitely been a real asset to add to the CV. Um, as we've already mentioned, I've also worked for All Sorts. So All Sorts is an LGBTQ creative writing sort of, well, so the charity itself is LGBTQ plus youth. Um, so I believe it's something like 13 to 25 I might be wrong with the ages I know we go up to 25 um, and we basically worked with them just sort of encouraging them with creative writing um, in a sort of different environment to schools we found it quite difficult to sort of have as much access to schools since being online obviously with safeguarding um, but that's really been helpful in helping us branch out so as we've already mentioned things like girl guides which I've also done um, all sorts was a really fun project and we actually made it a series of how to write a good story. Um, and the responses we got were really sort of enthusiastic. We had some really great writing from that. Um, so that was a really nice sort of warm environment to be in, in teaching that. Um, I've also been involved in sort of the video creation, the blog writing. Those are already accessible to the public again through the QR code that we've got through our link tree. So the videos have been really helpful resources again for teaching online. Um, similarly with the blog writing, although it's not so much teaching, it's more about how to stay involved within sort of the online environment, stay involved within literature, like that's kind of how the blog's gone, but actually we sort of developed lots of different things about education, English, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's probably just worth checking it out yourself really, if you're interested. Um, and finally, yeah, so Almost an Academy is a new tutoring opportunity that we've not actually started. It's in the process of developing. Um, but again, that's for students who really have had a bit of a tough time with COVID. Um, they've sort of had personal circumstances, which mean that they were sort of achieving quite high grades. And unfortunately, those grades have dropped. So we're hoping to work with them. And similar to the Red Balloon Centre, as Saskia was saying, we're going to try and tailor it to what they want, what they're interested in, to help sort of teach these students what creative writing can do for them, how to sort of regain their enthusiasm, but to make sure it's separated from school because we understand that a lot of students are really fatigued with Zoom, are really fatigued with learning after everything that's happened with COVID. So hopefully tailoring these workshops and these tutoring sessions to their needs will help them regain that enthusiasm and sort of regain the confidence in English.
Okay, I think that's all I have to say. Um, I'll pass back to you now, Tom, I think. Great, thank you so much. And I think what we hear from all those examples is a just how kind of innovative and um, passionate and, and energetic um, our, our student members have, have been in, you know, bringing forward all of these projects um, and how they've really been able to kind of adapt and, and be flexible um, in the, you know, with all of the challenges that we're all facing during lockdown. Uh, massive shout out to Abby O'Connell as well, who, who isn't able to be here today, but is an uh, incredibly important part of Sussex Rights, organising everything, keeping everything coordinated. Uh, again, she is a, what year is she in? She was, she's a, a third year student just going into her MA and uh, she puts us to shame. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, she's amazing and you're all amazing. Um, so yeah let me just i'll uh, navigate back to the qr code page one more time so you can see that uh so yeah i've showed you that and yeah um so yeah do check us out on social media and if you if you if you want to scan the qr code that will take you to a link tree page which will have a list of all of our, our different online presences and i do recommend checking that out um if you are a, a a student attending this session, um, an undergraduate or, or postgraduate student, and you're interested in being involved in Sussex Rights next year, um, QR code again is probably going to be the simplest way to find us, but I will also post um, our kind of email and, and ways of contacting us in the chat later in the session, I think, just so you'll, you'll be able to see that as well. And, and um, obviously, if you want to to find out more about what we do, this is will be the chance to ask, because I think uh, we'll go into the Q&A section now. Um, having shown you a bit about what we do and who we are. Um, so I'm going to kind of open the floor now to attendees. If we have any any questions uh, from, from people attending that you'd like to fire at us uh, using the using the Q&A panel, um, which I think will be on the, on the right hand side of your screen, if I'm correct. Um, so yeah, please do please do fire questions at us. I'm, I'm going to start us off with a question we have pre prepared. But while we're answering that, please do ask us your own questions. We'd really like to hear from you and, and have that conversation and that dialogue. Um, so I'm going to um, we've talked somewhat about like opportunities and skills that Sussex Rights has been able to provide for people. So I'm going to jump to the next question we've been thinking about, which is where do you want to go next with, with Sussex Rights? I think this is a good question for us to be thinking about. Where do, where do we want to go next with Sussex Rights? Um, anyone on our, on our team want to uh, offer an answer there? Or I'll pick on someone. Yeah, Saskia. So I'm, I'm going to be the recruitment officer um, the next year. It's going to be my final year. And I think it's going to be really um, exciting to try and get more first years and second years involved, just because um, unfortunately, a lot of our lovely members of third years and they've now left. So, um, so like Abby, for example, was such an amazing sort of powerhouse in like bringing us all together and organising. So it's going to be sort of trying to get more members involved. And I think it's interesting that a couple of our members came here through psychology students. So thinking particularly about getting students, maybe not from the Mars School, from broader subjects, from STEM, from um, other areas to join in with creative writing, because it's such a broad connective thing as everybody who's spoken about it has shown. And you don't always have to be a Mars student to get involved. So. Um, it would be great to see students sort of across the university get involved and it's just about so how do we reach out to them um, so yeah that's something i'm excited to do next year brilliant thank you any anyone else want to uh, want to respond to that or, or bring in their own ideas here okay well okay. i think this yeah sorry carry on the case is your i didn't see um, so, as is quite a common route with English, I think, um, I'm hoping to go into education, um, most likely teaching, but generally I am really interested in widening participation as well. Um, and it's been really great because I have had opportunities to sort of work with widening participation to develop workshops and develop um, sort of opportunities and things. But Sussex Rights being so student led has really helped me develop my confidence. So. Um, Emma actually taught me in a school's module where I was developing those skills um, and then I was able to transfer them into something like the all sorts workshop. So um, I did a lot of the sort of development of the activities and how to actually engage students, which has been really helpful in sort of thinking about my future career, because it was very much something where it felt quite natural, but so much so that I was like, oh, do I need to steer away from this? Do I need to steer away from education? Because 
it seems such an obvious choice. Whereas actually sort of working with Sussex Rights, it's solidified for me that actually this is a route that I want to go down, not just one that I feel that I should be going down. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's really, really important. Thank you. So we have a question uh, from one of our attendees. So thank you for that. So so Ed asks, um, how many schools are you reaching at the moment? And what's the range diversity of schools like across Sussex? And yeah, thank you. You said some, ni some nice things about our work. Um, you said you like the work we were doing, creating content for schools by commission, which, yeah, thank you. We've, we've really enjoyed doing that as well. So I think Ember was, was going to uh, answer that question. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so we worked across the, the last few years, I think we've worked with almost every single school in Sussex. I do, um, in an old slide, have a, a lovely graphic of all the different locations that we've, we've worked in. Um, our big schools that we've worked in locally have been uh, Patcham, Blackington Mill, um, and Cardinal Newman, um, Backer, of course, which is super handy being just over the bridge. Um, and uh, for quite a long time, we had a really good involvement with, with Long Hill and also with Gildridge. Um, and um, the work we're doing with Ormiston is, is a new venture, um, which is going to take us beyond Sussex. Um, and Ormiston is actually an academy trust. And it's uh, a relationship that's transferred from the head of English at Gildridge then became a very senior person in the Ormiston Academies Trust and that uh, rep is a trust that includes uh, 32 secondary schools, seven primary schools and one special school um, and includes over 30,000 students. Um, we do have of course a widening participation agenda which means that for example our pilot with Ormiston Academy has targeted um, 12 pupils um, who are not only um, identified as having fallen behind during this year, but they meet particular um, of the old polar three requirements. So this means that they must be on feasible meals or pupil premium and or a first generation scholar um, and or they are a, a looked after child. Um, so uh, we do target our work in that sense. Um, because we've always had a widening participation agenda and also that we went and we've intensified that um, during COVID because again um, educational inequalities have actually um, worsened significantly um, access to online tutoring um, to um, to workspaces and 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 uh, good learning environments um, all of these things have been made more challenging so um, we've been working uh, very carefully with Thomas and Academy. Um, we've held a series of meetings with um, the education team to really make sure that we've built um, the right kind of program to reach the kinds of students who will most benefit from receiving free tutoring. Because that's a really important part of Sussex Rights, which is it's a funded program. So we've historically um, received funding um, from the School of English, from widening participation, and from the Sussex Learning, uh, Sussex Learning Network Community Outreach Project, which sadly has now ended. Um, and we fund our students, as you can hear, our students put in a huge amount, far more than they receive in terms of hours paid, but they take this work incredibly seriously and they put a huge amount of time and energy and resources into it. And we see this as a redistributive e effect. You know that we are trying to do our work and I know that this is a phrase that is very politicized but you know to level the playing field sorry for adopting what is often a, a, a not very great phrase but it is really important that there's this redistributive effect um we all acknowledge that much as we have found the last year really hard we also have certain privileges by being at Sussex and we've been trying to um, really make sure we leverage um, that privilege and, and share it with people um, the best we can. Hence our work with, for example, the Red Balloon Centre. So yeah, I mean, I can't even begin to list without being very boring all of the schools we work with, but we literally go right the way out to the very far east of Sussex, all the way out to the very far west, to Portslade and, and um, who haven't, um, whether they're coming on campus or whether we go out to them. Um, so it's yeah, it's pretty extensive. Um, there was 
necessarily a little contraction and re uh, and pivoting during COVID, but that's opened up these new opportunities at Ormiston and, and Red Balloon Centre. So yes, it's been a really um, valuable expansion of our network in ways that we couldn't do if we hadn't gone online. So I suppose in some ways we kind of, you know, we have to sometimes acknowledge that the online world has been positive and being able to reach people in a different way. Um, if even though we would prefer in many ways to be in person in the schools interacting with with young people. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think just, yeah, that point about kind of levelling the play playing field, I think levelling the playing field is great if you're actually doing the work to level the playing field, which is what we're trying to do rather than assuming that it's that it's already level. Uh, but that's just what I think. Um, yeah, um, I wonder if uh, we'll, we'll give it a chance for um, attendees to ask more questions if they want to. I just want to ask one more question to um, our team, which is, um, uh, well, it's, it's kind of two questions together, uh, which we, we thought about earlier what do we think is the future of creativity in schools and how can schools and universities work together more strongly to improve life chances of um, young people in the art and, and particularly with regard to supporting the arts and arts and humanities that's sort of several questions at once but I think it kind of builds on what we just heard from Emma and I wonder if without picking on you I wonder if we could hear some thoughts from our our newer tutors Adam and Alice uh, we haven't had, had a chance to hear from yet um, and indeed anyone else uh, thoughts that people have about the future of creativity in schools and how schools and universities can work together. I'd love to chime in on this one if that's okay Tom. Um, the number one like most desired skill in any new employee in almost any field is creativity. It's what people want more and more and more of and yet we don't really have a lot of it in our standard education system which you know there's something going deeply wrong there and uh, you know, creativity just feeds everything we do. And I think it's, without getting too philosophical for a Wednesday afternoon, I think it is a big part of what makes us human. So uh, it, it's it's vitally important to everything. And it's also not just, you know, that's the kind of the economic uh, saleable side, if you like, but it's also one of the best things for your mental health to be able to lose yourself in writing, to be creative, to be productive, to make things, to make stuff is really, really good for your brain uh, in every way. So I think um, in terms of how we get more of it going, things like Sussex rights are really important, things that are student led, things that are led by younger people for younger people um are so so important so i think we need to do we need to keep doing what we're doing and i hope that we can kind of maybe inspire people in other universities to do the same thing and maybe maybe this could be part of this whole new normal that we keep talking about that would be great <laughs> yeah thank you that's really well put um so we have another question uh, from um our attendees uh, which I think again kind of kind of feeds into what we've been talking about uh, so from Mayuk um, networking in the times of the pandemic is the most challenging area to cover to inspire education how do we develop these skills uh, during these times so, so how do we develop this kind of skill of networking specifically which I think is something that has been has been part of Sussex rights I wonder if anyone has any thoughts on this so um, I could possibly ask Ellie to come in on this but um, in, in there's a couple of things uh, one is um, obviously using social media um, and thinking though quite carefully about platform use um, because uh, things like Zoom require a huge amount from um, from people's devices and Wi-Fi connection. Um, but actually by using Facebook and other platforms and also uh, YouTube videos and things like that, you can actually use lower data demand uh, platforms um, to reach people. I think the most important thing is taking risks and, and, and putting together an offer and going to people and saying, let's do something. The whole um, uh, youth cafe collaboration um, through Lockdown Live just came from the fact that we had gone in for a funding bid together um, back in December 2019 that hadn't gone through. Um, but we had learned about each other then. It came to lockdown and I was trying to think, what can we do to make the summer better for people and do something good and positive around Sussex rights? 
Um, and so that's when I um, got in contact with the youth cafe's director and said, let's go for it, let's do something. And we went, went from there. So I think it's a combination of thinking carefully about the platforms that you use, leveraging social media in a responsible way, um, but also working out what it is that you can do and, and getting in contact with people and saying, let's do it. Um, let's make something happen. And, and from there, you can usually build something. Um, but And it might also be that, as we've experienced, we've put many irons in many fires. Um, and I actually think that that's a beneficial way of approaching it. I know that some people will say, well, you know, do one thing and focus on that. Actually, I really like that kind of spread effort because we then worked out what's really successful and also that things cross fertilize. So doing the competition might lead to a new contact. So for example, we ran the competition, we had a school teacher who got really involved and, and she said it really helped her um, reluctant writers to write. Um, and that led to a blog post where Katie, in fact, into, with Simran, interviewed the teacher about what it's like to be a fairly new teacher teaching in a pandemic, which was, again, you know, these sort of the energy that comes from trying something um, usually leads to, to new outcomes, which, again, is, is an important thing um, for, for us to really develop these connections. And in terms of skills, I think the more you work with partners, um, the more you refine your practice. So um, in terms of developing the skills, so a lot of um, our online safety came through um we developed our own practices for online safety, um, but Girl Guides gave us additional um, ways of, of, of thinking about online safety and how we protect young people who are engaging um, with workshops and things online. So again, the more you come into contact with other people, the more you will develop skill sets between you um, to en enhance your, your delivery of, of um, inspirational education. So I hope that helped um, uh, answer your question. Um, I'm afraid, unfortunately, uh, I, I know you posted today, um, is it possible to interact if you'd like to speak? Unfortunately, no, uh, that, that's not been uh, enabled with this form of webinar. However, we do have some interactive spaces that you can contribute to. And if you'd like to post a question more as a, as a response, if there's something you'd like to articulate to us and, uh, and express to us, please do. We'd love to make those connections and also follow us on our social media and feel free to get in contact with us by email after the event. Okay. I hope that helps, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great answer. Um, okay. So I think uh, this is about the time to move on to our next section. So we're going to run a bit of a creative writing workshop um, that's kind of the kind of thing that, that we would run in schools but hopefully adapted a little bit uh, for your good selves um so we kind of had it had a bit of a chat about what kinds of um workshops we could do um that would would work for this context um, and we went back and forth a bit but in the end we went for well maybe i'll, I'll let i think ellie was going to lead this section so i'll maybe let ellie introduce what we're going to do sure thanks tom um yeah so as Tom was saying, we were thinking about what to do um, for the session and we thought maybe we could go back to um, a prompt that we used for our first writing competition um, and maybe use that to encourage you guys to write. Um, now, this is a little bit different to how we normally do online workshops because normally we can see everyone and obviously we can't see you guys. <laughs> so what we'll probably do, I think, is give you this prompt and give you a little bit of probably just a short amount of time to do some writing um, yourself, maybe 10 minutes or something. Um, so the prompt is behind the mask. Now, this was one um, that yeah, we used for our competition in back in November. So a lot of people would sort of think um, about medical masks, particularly in the time of COVID. Um, but there are so many different masks you could use. They're sort of, there's the typical, the masks of the theatre. Um, and actually, I think a few of our tutors have different masks with them. I am one of them. So this is a mask that I have in my fancy dress box. Um, it's a little sort of Venetian mask. Um, it's actually for a jester in particular. Um, so that's the kind of masks that I had lying about, as well as many sort of <laughs> COVID medical masks as well. Um, I think you can see Alice has one in her screen. So this is 
another yeah face covering COVID mask. Um, Emma, did you have one as well, I think? Yeah, so Emma's one here, you've got a clear screen where you can see the mouth. I think this is a really interesting one because there's quite a lot of conversations about um, you know, the difficulties of masks in terms of reading people's facial expressions and seeing how, how they're interacting, especially in an educational environment. So if you're going around our campus at university, you have to wear face coverings. Um, so that sort of gets through that barrier. Um, so with this prompt in particular, you can sort of, you can just decide what kind of mask you want to use. We've actually got um, a link here. I think it's been sent out to everyone. Um, yep, the Lucid Spark. So if you went on um, on that link, you'll see in, uh, we've got, hang on, let's just get it up. There we go. So we've got a few different questions on um, little posts about things you could think of to do with this prompt. So if you're thinking of this mask, for example, it might be something that you just come across in the street. So this is sort of something that we used to talk about in our workshops with students. We'd say, here's an object, for example, the scary doll that Tom was showing in the pictures earlier. Imagine that you come across this object in the street. It's just lying there in the street. Now you could write about your experience of finding this object in the street. You could write about um, just a description of the object itself. You could write a poem about it. It could be any sort of bit of writing. It could just be pure sort of uh, stream of consciousness, consciousness kinds of writing. It's just a way to free up um, your creativity and get you writing. So if you came across that mask in the street, you could ask yourself these kind of questions. So how old do you think it is? Where are you when you find it? Is it in an unusual setting? Is it just in the street? Is it in a forest? Does that change your reaction to it? Does that change what you think about it? Um, is someone wearing it? If so, why? What kind of mask is it for that reason? Has it been discarded? I don't know about you guys, but I see a lot of um, medical masks just discarded on the streets or in the beaches of Brighton. Um, oh, here we go. We've got it on the screen now. Thank you, Tom. Um, what's its value? Does it look like it's an expensive mask? Does it look like it's important to someone? And most importantly, I think, what are you going to do now you've seen it? What's your reaction? Because um, it's one thing having a bit of creative writing, just describing an object, um, which is quite a, you know, a main point that we do with object narratives in schools. But with a mask, I think you can take it a bit further. So if you're someone who has done a lot of creative writing before, you could take this opportunity to really run with an idea and kind of maybe make a narrative out of it or make a really interesting poem or write down your thoughts about the controversies of masks maybe. Um, or if this is literally your first time creative writing and you've never done it before and you just want to give it a go, you could very well just go with a descriptive, a descriptive bit of writing. Um, or yeah, the emotions of walking along, finding this mask or seeing it on someone, maybe you're at a theatre, maybe it's pre-COVID times. <laughs> If if you were um if we used this writing prompt before COVID, I think it would probably have quite a different response to how people approach it now. Um, but yeah, so if you're on the Lucid Spark site, you can ask us questions or write your own little notes about what what your initial responses are. We've got um a couple of suggestions in the middle box. Actually, you could just write a single word. What's the first thing you think of when you see um, this mask? What kind of mask is it? Are there any phrases that come to your mind? Um, yeah, so do feel free to respond on there. Um, I think we'll do a little 10 minute session. I will set a timer. I would encourage everyone to do a bit of writing, not just attendees, but panelists too. Um, if you don't have a pen and paper to hand, by all means, just use Word or notes or whatever on your laptop if, if that's what you're using, if you're using a computer. Um, Equally, if you just want to write a list, that's fine too. But just see how much you can get done in 10 minutes. And there will be a little opportunity afterwards to share your writing if you're comfortable doing that and if it is something that you want to do. So it's five past now. Um, I will let you all know in 10 minutes, so at quarter past. And yes, if you have any questions, please do post it on that site. Okay, good luck, everyone.
yeah, and, and just kind of add, if you have been able to to log into Lucid, yeah, please do, um, you know, drop in ideas um, onto uh, on on the kind of the post-it note bits on there. Um, we'll maybe put some put some ideas on there as well to kind of to get people thinking too. Um, if you have been able to get into Lucid, you can always message us um, using the uh, the Q and A function again. Just kind of message us with ideas or responses to specific things, and we can add those to Lucid as well. If if you haven't been able to to log into Lucid, um, and yeah, while you're doing that, also if if you want to work on a longer bit of writing on your own screen, and then you can share that uh, if you want to. Anything I've missed? So I'm just going to read out some of the suggestions we're we're getting on here, and again, feel free to add to add to the um, the page as we're going along. Um, so, where were you? Where you found the mask? Um, so, is it an unusual setting? So, setting medical detritus leaves and masks in the gutter um, could be one way of describing the setting. And again, this is the kind of thing we use in sessions. It's a very kind of free and open way of just saying. How would you, what kind of ideas does this spark off? What are some general ways of, of describing? You don't have to have a narrative fully thought out. Um, by the way, as well, you don't have to write a narrative if you want to write a poem or something more kind of fragmented or ex experimental. I'm a big fan of uh, the experimental myself, so that's very welcome too. Um, where did they get it from? Is it a gift, a purchase, or maybe handmade? A gift from a friend to remind me of Hong Kong. So that's immediately really kind of evocative. Um, raises a lot of possibilities about what this object could be um what sort of person might it belong to what is the owner like so so two diverging possibilities a tired commuter on their way to the shops after work or a medieval plague doctor so something very kind of outlandish uh, from our point of view or something very kind of normal and every day um And someone's put uh, i pay attention to eyes and have forgotten how to read mouths so thinking about how how this this kind of uh importance of masks kind of might change us psychologically. It dangles from the ear of a coffee drinker. I love that. That's very evocative. Um, can you tell if someone is smiling? started pulling faces without people knowing. <laughs> it's really good stuff.
Encrusted with dust and empty spider nests, the mask hung in the flourishing ivy. It somehow belonged in the wasteland, the thin frame of wire poking through the medical mesh, looking down to a splendour of household waste. The gutter was choked with weeds, thick and spalling dandelions, brittle nettles, yet no other masks came to sight. Here the mask appeared as a peculiar flower, kind of a virus that had blossomed in its obscurity. That's brilliant. A lot of inspiration to pick up there. A thief prefer preparing for the next heist. Yeah, brilliant. So this is a really good uh, example of a uh, completely, completely different kind of diverging way we could interpret a mask. And like, what we do find when we work with, with school kids, they often are really oriented towards more kind of action, crime, or kind of horror-driven narratives, you know. Uh, I think partly because that's the, a lot of the stuff they're getting in the media, and that's a lot of stuff that's exciting, and, and it's also a good framework to build a story around because it's built on action and plot plot momentum, I think. So that doesn't work for everyone necessarily, but, but it does work as, as a framework for a lot of a lot of students we've found. One thing we've not actually mentioned, so a lot of the time when we work with um, especially like school students um, is we really emphasize like not the non-importance, but we try and make sure that they're not restricted by spelling or grammar or anything like that. Um, because I think we found with the school environment, because it is so focused heavily on you need to tick these boxes and make these grades actually removing those really removes the barriers that sort of like it gives them an excitement to write when they're not restricted as much um and you know there's no sort of sense of oh yeah like i'm gonna write something really stupid it's actually really sort of freeing for a lot of the students i think um which is really lovely to see Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for for bringing that up. That has been a really important part. Uh, that it's, it's it's not about kind of getting it right, and and we're kind of trying to get away from the idea that there is a single way to get it right. It's much more about freedom of expression. Um, getting something on the page, even if you think you can't, uh, is one of the most important things. And that's why prompts work really well as well, because because you don't just have a blank page. You have something to start from. Wearing lipstick leaves a red shadow of where my mouth has been, making shapes unseen by others. Yeah, that whole thing of what happens to makeup when you wear a mask, I, I think, has been really interesting for a lot of people. When I take my mask off, I feel like a part of my face comes with it. Um, some other kind of diverse examples of kinds of masks. Uh, a surgeon preparing for an intense surgery. A Venetian mask enrobed in jewels. An 18th century mask in, in masquerade literature. And, you know, if we want to get literary, we can think about all the different ways masks have been used in literary history from from Greek tragedy and comedy to Japanese theatre to uh, Commedia dell'arte to uh, I'm sure many others I'm, I'm forgetting. Um, On that point, um, if people are interested in Master Masquerade, I know that students that I've taught on sense and sexuality will already know about this uh, author, but Terry Castle and her work on Masquerade, it's an old one, came out in the 80s, but it's still kind of the seminal text where if you're interested in kind of cultures of mask wearing um, and how we might think about that in literary terms, that's a good place as any to start. Um, she really establishes the field of, of thought in that area. Yeah, absolutely. And then that makes me think of um, if we think of masks in, in theatre in particular, how the mask can be can reveal something as well as hiding something. Right? You can you can you can become or show a particular part of yourself um, through wearing a mask. I think that's been an experience for some people during lockdown as well. Think of the use of masks during protests. Think of the the V for Vendetta mask that became a symbol. Um, 
I think about the symbolism of the mask used to discuss race and racism. Think of uh, Black Skin, White Masks by Franz, Franz Fanon, the uh, archetypal text, where he uses, again, this metaphor of the mask to talk about his experience of, of racism as a black man. Um, the list goes on. And this is something that I think we really try to do with all of our work at Sussex Right, is we can have something quite simple as a premise um but what we what we're always searching for in the kinds of prompts that we create is an elasticity in that prompt where you could give this same task to um a very young child who's been experiencing covid um and they will have their views and perspectives and their thoughts and their experiences but you can also engage with it at a very sophisticated and nuanced level and locate it in a wider academic discourse. And for us, that's the ideal kind of task, which allows that, that breadth of, of, of idea. And certainly the object narrative session that we um, discussed earlier, which this is sort of part of that object narrative work. Um, when we were at um, Blatchington Mill, we actually ran an entirely mixed session where um, young people from their um, special educational needs uh, department which deals with young people with quite profound learning disabilities um, and physical disabilities as well um, they were able to join the class on object narratives um, and um, it's it was really empowered them to participate and to participate in a way that um, was very genuine and meaningful to them as well as to everybody else taking part in the group and it was a very much an equal conversation around these prompts. Um, and that's really important. Also, yeah, we, we've kind of been talking, I think, both because this has been quite inspiring and, and there's always interesting things to say. Also, because it's weird to have silence over Zoom. That always feels like the wrong thing. But we will say also the role of silence in our creative writing workshops is, is really important. One of the massive challenges, particularly in, in school groups, is to just get uh, pupils to sit down for five or ten minutes and, and write something without talking to each other and uh, keeping... Um, their communication on the page rather than being distracted by anything else it's really hard but when it happens when that silence descends it's uh, always absolutely magical and, and really rewarding when there's the silence of, of people who are who are doing their communication on on paper is always really good so uh, this is perhaps an unusual level of silence for a zoom session but i'm hoping we've been able to kind of embrace it today So I think we're just in the last minute of um, writing down your ideas. Sorry, we went a little bit over then, but um, that's all right. I think everyone was really getting into that. So if you just take the last minute to finish up any ideas and we'll have a look at what's been written.
just looking at a few of these now, you can really see that some of the writing does come out of just these short spaces of time when you do just get a moment just to sit and have a think from the tiniest bit of inspiration. There's a really beautiful example here where it says, encrusted with dust and empty spider nests, the masks hung um, in the flourishing ivy. Oops, sorry, smooth. It somehow belonged in the wasteland, the thin frame of wire poking through the medical mesh, looking down to, to a splendor of household waste. The gutter was choked with weeds, thick and sprawling dandelions, brittle nettles, yet no other sight, no other mask came to sight. Here the mask appeared as a peculiar flower, a kind of virus that had blossomed in obscurity. Another little great little example here, the crumbling streets run down to the emerald water in a discarded Venetian mask. In such waters, jewels glimmer in the coming dusk. And I've been looking around as well, you can also see some like really good, like just in, like, like inspirational ideas and just like really interesting thinking points about all CPR dummies are modeled on the death mask of an unnamed woman who drowned in the sign. Who was she? What was she thinking of her now immortal face? Uh, definitely information I didn't, I hadn't, I didn't, I hadn't heard of before. Yeah, thank you. And we have this really nice one uh, on the left here. Late January and masks began to appear on the Paris metro. Known for its fashion, such coverings appeared rather foolish, and yet over the coming weeks they came to be seen everywhere. What appeared as a frightening nightmare in a place so far from the stately Paris streets left the Luxembourg lonely and discarded. In the blush of a February evening, the sky tinged oyster pink, she weeps like a forgotten lover. Her Parisians are tucked up inside, they shall not frequent her any time soon just like so evocative and mysterious must be robert w chambers if anyone remembers him says it's just me um tom i'm not sure if it, i think it's your screen we're showing would it be possible to move a bit towards the um the right just uh, there's a really great bit of the anonymous anonymous sort of nature of the mask and how we sort of got used to it and the comfort of um i think there's someone who's talking about how they, they saw someone who they didn't want to see, they didn't want to talk to them about, and the mask gave them the opportunity to get out of it. It was a great little contribution. Yeah, here it is. I miss, I'll miss masks when they're gone. The other day I walked past someone I didn't want to talk to, but I didn't have to because they didn't recognise recognize me with the mask on. So it's one of those brilliant little things that you don't really consider with COVID that um, it, sort of, it gives you that socially acceptable layer of an, 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 uh, an non uh, so the word anonymity, um, which some people really miss when it's gone. So um, we're coming towards the end of our time together. Um, what we have set up for everyone is a Padlet. So what we would normally do from um, an exercise like this, where we've had these sort of collaborative fragments, um, we might have done a series of, of such collaborative fragments. And then we would actually invite people to work either on their own or in small groups to develop that narrative but they don't have to just use their own words they can actually if they've seen something else that they like more they can go and play with that or they can in fact start bringing um fragments together um so what we have set up for everybody and and please don't feel that you have to do it but if you wanted to explore this some more we have created a padlet for people um we like padlet um because you can share it quite openly. It doesn't matter what network or, or, or like school platform people are using. Padlet can be used by anyone. Um, but also you can post anonymous, uh, there's me chewing the same word up that Adam did. You can post anonymously um, and it's set up to be posted on anonymously or you can put in your name if you want to acknowledge that this is your piece of writing. 
but we think it's really helpful to be able to say to people okay we've been planning in this collaborative manner and if we're in a real classroom we might have a3 sheets with people kind of writing all over them upside down and sideways and however they want to um here of course we've adapted to a digital environment and then and then we give that space to people bringing out whichever bits of inspiration they want to work with and that kind of collaboration again we feel breaks down that really kind of overly intense relationship people form with their writing like they've got to create some writing that fits into a set of categories that will receive certain marks and it's all this sort of quite tortured um insular relationship that that people form with the page and and indeed for our gcse students their creative writing now is all done in an exam experience which really intensifies that kind of um isolated experience of, of relying on your own self and that piece of blank paper so yes if you would like to have a look at the padlet um and if you would like to post some creative writing in response to today's work um the padlet will be open for you to to go and uh, place things in there but also um that lucid press that you've been engaging with is is yours to use um you can keep accessing it um and you can download it you can keep it as an online uh piece of, of writing so entirely up to to you how you would like to use it i see a hand has come up um uh if malcolm you'd like oh no i think that was a wave to say goodbye um but yes we're coming to the end of the session thank you everyone for uh taking part do go and check out our padlet if you'd like to um, and continue writing but we hope that today has given you some sense of what we've been doing um and uh, a real ability to um see the kind of work that we're doing hear from different people who've had different kinds of um roles in uh sussex rights this year um please do get in touch uh, via our gmail um we'd love to continue the conversation uh, mike would love to hear from you unfortunately this platform doesn't necessarily facilitate us hearing from you as, as, as um easily but please do write some comments in the in the question and answer format if you would like to um we invite everybody to to um also keep in contact with us via our social media um and our email and it might be worth doing one more screen share of, of the um QR code for the link tree. Um, I'll hand back to, to Tom to sign us out, but I just wanted to say, um, as the director through this pretty challenging year, it just wouldn't have been possible to do all of this work without this amazing team. Oh, yeah, a team of, of which you're seeing only a small number. Um, there are people who couldn't be here today who I'd, have, I'd love to be able to thank. Abby's had her name mentioned, uh, Simran running the competitions, um, Mia and, and Millie and all kinds of other people have been involved in running all of these events. And it just couldn't have happened without our amazing students um, being inventive and hardworking and really dedicated to um, the work that we've been doing. So this is just my chance to say um, as publicly as I can, um, thank you everyone. Um, you've really just made this year a lot happier more enjoyable um and more connected um in a year that has otherwise been really tough on all of us and i just wanted to take that moment to acknowledge the work of everyone um ellie tom uh as well for your specific roles too so yeah and thank you for your contribution today so that's that's my piece and i'll hand over to tom to, to sign us off yeah, and thank you so much, Emma. Right back at you with all of that. Uh, we absolutely, we literally couldn't have done it without you. So uh, I could not say that in a more literal sense. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for being involved today, everyone. Um, as, as I say, uh, as Emma suggested, I've, I've put the QR code back up on screen. I've posted our email address uh, to everyone in the chat, uh, particularly if you are a student and you'll be around next year and you'd like to get involved, either postgraduate or undergraduate students, um, do drop us a line at social media, sussexrights at gmail.com. That's currently our main address. Um, and and um, you know let let us know about your interests because we are always recruiting and hopefully some of the stuff you've seen today will be interesting uh, to you. Um, other than that, yeah, follow us on social media. We'll maybe ask the organisers if they can email the attendees with uh, the links for the for the Padlet and the um, the Lucid Spark. That might be good. So then you can um, have a look back at that if you want to, and and post things on the Padlet if you want to. But yeah, other than that, I think we'll we'll call it a day. Thank you so much for attending and and listening to us.